Hi, welcome to Project Geospatial. I'm Adam Simmons, and here with this episode, uh, we have a special guest. Uh, well, for this episode, it's titled Crowdsourcing and Environmental Hazards. And here with me today is Dr. Caroline, Caroline Holtquist. Uh, and she has a very extensive background, and uh, I want to let you introduce yourself, and you can talk to us about the projects you've been in, and and uh, well, your your just diverse experience you have with the geospatial industry, and and tons of projects along the way. Thanks so much, Adam. I'm really happy to be here and talk with you today. Really going to focus a lot on crowdsourcing, and tell you a little bit about some of my work. Um, so I'm a postdoctoral research scientist right now. I'm at Columbia University. I work with CSEN, which is the Center for International Earth Science Information Network. And the projects there really focus a lot on distributing international data so that many other scientists can use it. And it's in the New York um, City area. Um, and so my current research focuses on developing computational methods to predict flood risk. And I do so by integrating a diversity of different types of data from real estate to look at properties, remote sensing data, hydrologic modeling, d different types of earth systems information, and socioeconomic products. So uh, just to talk about you specifically, you got a, you got a long background with a lot of different projects working on uh, as, a, as a research assistant uh, and a PhD intern working on tons of projects along the way. Now you seem to uh, focus a lot of uh, crowdsourcing. Um, is that how you started off or did you, uh, is that something you grew into and how did you get involved with that? Yeah. So I guess I first was really interested in geography and kind of in middle school. So I guess I got an early start. Um, I started doing like a geography bee and was really interested in it and learned about as many topics as I could. And then when I was in high school, someone handed me a CD from Esri. It was the ArcGIS software. And I started playing around with it and ended up realizing that I really loved GIS and that you could do a lot with it, that it's a really powerful tool. And so then over the next couple of years, I started getting engaged with some humanitarian projects because I guess I really have this focus on wanting to do so, um, research or projects for social good. So I started contributing to a number of online crowdsourcing projects where you'd look at remote sensing imagery or you'd contribute in different ways. So it was a really big like educational benefit for me. And it made me kind of dig deeper into this interest of how you can use this data in different applications for different products um, to help people during disasters, um, got to help different um, projects like during Haiti um, and with hurricanes and things like that. And I realized like it's a really uh, interesting and meaningful way to contribute, even when you don't have a degree or a professional education, even when you're young, you can still contribute in meaningful ways. And that's what really made me interested in developing my skills more, my technical abilities. Um, ended up taking remote sensing classes and GAS classes um, and getting a bachelor's degree in geography. And while I was there, I had a couple of professors that asked me if I wanted to work on some projects with them. So I ended up working on some machine learning projects with wildfires, um, started to get into kind of like the disaster space. Um, and also looked at some economic side of things. And so I kind of see my path now as kind of combining some like socioeconomic and meaningful factors, um, working with social data and this interest in geospatial technologies. And so I did my PhD in geography and social data analytics at Penn State. And the topic of my dissertation was on validating citizen science data for decision making during disasters. And I really specialize in this fusion of geographic information in order to try to understand complex environments, um, particularly in the light of vulnerability to environmental hazards, because there's this piece, this connection between these physical systems that we're modeling and this human side of impact. And I think it's really important to connect between those so that we're not just looking at how much of a flood event that we're having, let's say, but also who it's impacting and where are the areas that are most at risk um, because of that. And social media and citizen science and a lot of other, those sort of contributions can provide information about where people are and how they're impacted. And that's what really 
got me involved in those topics. And I worked with the Geoinformatics and Earth Observation Laboratory at Penn State with Dr. Guido Schiavone. And he was very influential in building up my skills and my capabilities to be able to work with this data from diverse sources and integrate it in a computational way so you can really take advantage of it and understand it statistically and understand spatial relationships and be able to validate and really look at the quality of the data for specific decision-making um, problems. Um, so looking at it as a solution. And I think that's where a lot of my work kind of goes. Um, there's a lot of people who look at citizen science data and a lot of people who are interested in it look at it for the educational value, which it absolutely is. But I think there needs to be a lot more work at how this evolves with the methods that we use in the geospatial field. And if there's certain methodologies that we should consider um, differently because we have data that's not spatially sampled in the same way that we have with traditional remote sensing or other types of products. And really like look at the unique characteristics of crowdsourced data so that we can use it appropriately. No, that's great. Uh, to kind of take it back for the audience a little bit, uh, in your own words, can you define crowdsourcing? Uh, because I think it is a definition of, uh, it's something that has evolved over the years. And it's something that used, probably used to be pretty cut and dry to describe. Now I think it's begun, uh, begun to be a lot more complex into figuring out what it means, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So crowdsourcing, I guess, at a simple level just means sourcing something from the crowd. And that can be many, many different things. And there are some crowdsourcing projects that are just purely looking at like digital contributions. So you might be contributing to clicking where penguins are at an image of a glacier, or you might be picking out specific things in an image that you have just in a digital setting. And then there's a number of crowdsourcing projects that also look at like environmental monitoring um, or look at participatory GIS, where you're adding or contributing to a, a standardized data set, let's say, like road layers, um, like a static layer. And there's other ones that are more temporal, that are more like changes. So like you have a disaster event, you want to see, you want to detect what the change is. And so there's some like rapid response sort of humanitarian projects out there too. But I mean, crowdsourcing, I think, is a growing field as we find more things that the crowd does the crowd can contribute to as institutions create new projects in a way we're changing the definition of it we're like continuing evolving what the crowd contributes to and a lot of the movement i also see in this space is that more and more it's not just organizations like academic institutions or government organizations that are asking for help from the crowd it's also a lot of times the crowd creating their own or the public creating their own projects and developing their own expertise in different areas so that they have their own control of the data, the analysis, the objectives, and it can lead to some very different projects. And that's really where a lot of my research is focused on is this, this kind of like new or growing area. There's always been crowdsourcing like for quite a few years back, we can date like um, some of the early ones were like in the around 1800 with Wetwell who was getting tied information from across the Atlantic. And he sent letters to people in other places to send him data about the tides. And that was, you know, an early form, let's say, of this kind of crowd thing where you have to have the crowd in order to do that project. They didn't have sensors and networks set up all over that space. Um, and then I think increasingly with the use of technologies, we can have a lot of those sensors and those networks set up, but we can also get contributions from every person because every person has a mobile device or many mobile devices. Um, and then also can create low cost sensors where we can have contributions from many people um, over a space. And that's kind of where a lot of my work ended up leading into is these distributed networks of uh, low cost sensors that were put together by citizen science organizations that started them themselves, used existing technology, combined it with some new technologies that they developed to be able to have an application in which you're collecting data and sharing it and analyzing it and making decisions from it, even at a citizen level. 
Well, let's go into an example of uh, one of those projects that uh, you mentioned. You know, uh, from what do you think is the best current implementation of crowdsourcing or example of it? So I guess I wouldn't necessarily speak on the best. Um, it'd be really hard to define what exactly you mean by best. But one project that I've worked with a lot that has a huge data set and is, is very well developed and a lot of methodologies and backgrounds and people with experience in this area is the SafeCast project, which is in Japan. And it really sparked from a need um, right after the Fukushima event in March 2011, where people wanted to know what their local levels of radiation were. And there was some data from the government at that time, but it was pretty limited. It was only in certain areas. And the existing sensor network that was set up for radiation was mostly offline because of a combination of the earthquake and the tsunami and the resulting damage from that, from the power outages and things like that. So there was very limited data, particularly at like a local level. Um, so people wanted to understand what their exposure was for the radiation in those areas. Um, and so there was a project that started up with the group in Tokyo where they basically were able to pull together this sensor pretty quickly where you're able to have a Geiger counter that people could carry around with them. It's a very small device. Um, and you're able to carry it with them and be able to record their levels. And eventually they ended up developing it where they had Bluetooth connectivity, where you put it on an app on your phone. You could automatically upload it onto their site. They have thousands of contribute or thousands of contributors and millions of contributions now. And it's become bigger than just the area there, the Fukushima region. It's become all over Japan and also many different parts of the world. And it's really developed this idea of citizen science as being coming up with these other scientific objectives beyond that. And I think this idea of citizen science is having some sort of scientific outcome that you're really aiming towards. And they really developed this, these ideals around having a baseline of what the global radiation levels are in places so that if there is a change, you can detect it. And that's really, I think, the foundation of a lot of environmental monitoring is that you have to have a baseline in order to know what the difference is. Um, and so I think they've really developed a lot as an organization over the years and continue to develop objectives, which continue to keep people engaged in the project, to con continue to contribute, and really to have a breadth um, across the globe of contributions from many individuals. So, so I think you bring up an uh, interesting point, even indirectly here, with uh, you, you mentioned that, so for the Fukushima example, uh, they pretty much took advantage of sensors in the hands of citizens, correct? Where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but, but so is there a difference in terminology here where you have citizens using the sensors they have available and just by nature of having those just distributed sensors across the, 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 we'll call it the populace, taking advantage of that data, uh, compared to the actual citizens inputting the data manually themselves. Because I think there's also a stigma around uh, crowdsourcing in that when you're taking perhaps non-experts and contributing to something that could sometimes be a highly technical field, you get some type of trust issues with the data sets, right? So, yeah. um, but, but that's not the case with this because you're putting, you're using the sensors that are already in the hands of, of people. Yeah, I think there's a couple different levels there. One of it is specifically looking at the task that you're asking people to do. And that's kind of like an ongoing thing that people have developed is this idea of what type of tasks would you have the crowd do, the general public, anybody that contributes versus people whom you might have to give a bit of training. So some sort of um, some citizen science projects will have a training involved in order to contribute. You have to do this training so that you're qualified to contribute to the specific question. Let's say you're doing water quality monitoring and it has to be done a specific way. Or you're doing rain measurements like the Cocoa Rose project out of um, Boulder. So like you have specific guidelines by which you have to collect the data at a specific time in a specific way in order to have that kind of standardization. Other things where you're just carrying a sensor, I mean, you don't really need to have a specific, um, you know, uh, understanding of anything particular in order to carry that sensor. Um, I think there's different levels. Partially, you could be looking at the organization, so who it is that's organizing the project, 
and what their scientific expertise is. And then you also look at the tasks of the individuals. So um, basically, what is their level of what type of scientific need do they have in order to complete this task? Um, so if you're doing things with clicking on penguins, like, you know, anyone could do that, like children, right? And so like, it really depends at what level. Now, there's another side of this, though. And that's the idea of deception, which a lot of people in the GON world talk about, is this idea that there might be people who are intentionally trying to contribute information that's wrong in some way. It could just be for fun, honestly, for some people. Unfortunately, there's people out there like that. And other people could be like other types of motives, of course. And I think the idea there is that we need to develop different ways that we can analyze data in a way in which we can have some sort of quality assessment or some sort of validation. You could analyze anomalies, let's say. And that's actually some things that the SafeCast project has developed is they look not just at the contributions, but they also compare it to other contributions from other sensors that are in the same area. And so if there's something that will is very different, it'll flag it as, um, as an issue of something to look into further, let's say, right? And then you might have someone else go to that area to check it. Um, could potentially be an outcome. I don't know of them doing that. I'm just saying like, there's ways in which you could get around this idea of validating. And this is really what developed into my research question for my dissertation was how do we validate data? What is a way in which we can actually compare it or in which we could assess its validity in certain places and times? And so I took a data set that was provided from the Department of Energy, the US Department of Energy, that was working in collaboration with the Japanese um, government um, to collect, based on helicopter and plane surveys, um, the distribution of radiation in that area. And I was able to take that data set and compare it at the same spaces and time by using what we know from the physics-based approach about the decay of radiation. And so basically standardizing it or normalizing it, let's say, to the same time and place um, so that you could do a comparison of the different data sets um, and really look at the magnitude. And if they were the different networks uh, were picking up the same magnitude in the same places. Excellent. Uh, so how do you feel about the remote sensing side of things? Because you mentioned some of the, uh, the, the deception piece, which... I know of because, but I'm just not convinced that's just a thing to worry about as much because you could just like you said because that could be from from certain algorithms or techniques that could be filtered out with uh, you know anomaly detection. The people who themselves contribute could be their own anomaly in a crowd that contributes to have some type of standard deviation between them all, right? So, yeah. um, but 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 how do you feel about? Uh, you know, you know, getting, I think there's best practices out there who, uh, like Amazon, who are using things like Ground Truth or Mechanical Turk to push uh, projects out there, remote sensing out to the general populace. Uh, and there's other ones just like it as well. Uh, and, and saying, hey, here's an image, tell us what's on it, or, mm -hmm. or find find this activity, find the lost hiker in the woods or or, or in the snow, that type of thing. Uh, but then then you have, the, but now you're introducing a uh, tradecraft to people who, from a different perspective, now they're looking at images overhead mm -hmm. where they might think something's a certain thing and it could maybe something completely different. Um, so that type of thing, do you do you think that's okay to crowdsource, or do you think that's something else that should be trained? Where do you where do you lean on that, and 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 maybe that's that's not something to worry about at all. And the crowd eventually um, it is more accurate the more data you have. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a lot of the argument for having many people check the same things. So let's say if you have someone who's paid by the government and they are only able to do this one time, right? And they're not paying 50 other people to look at it. The idea of being from the crowd, they might not be an expert, but if you have 50 people look at it, you know, hopefully there's a check. And another thing is a lot of those projects will have like a ranking. So if you are good at it, you know, over time and you keep having accurate answers, you get like a higher rank. So if you are ranked and you're considered an expert, or if you're maybe like me, where you just do those sort of things for fun, and you know, you're know you also involved in it, you start developing a sort of ranking. So like you would have someone who's able to check it, who's able to 
you know, maybe you push those things that are showing some uncertainty to certain individuals um, that are able to confirm it and check it based on their understanding or even compare it to other imagery at a particular time. Um, so I think there's a lot of workarounds um, methodologically where you can um, consider that. Um, and I guess the main concerns can be when you don't have a particular way to validate something. So let me give you an example of with Haiti, there was somebody who made a contribution that an orphanage had, you know, been destroyed or damaged in an area and there were many people who needed help, right? And how do you check that? Like, you know, you can look at imagery and you're like, okay, yeah, there's building collapse in that area but they diverted resources, right? They actually sent people to that area to go check and it w there wasn't an orphanage there. Or there wasn't any, right? There wasn't anything happening. It was somebody in Texas who had made this contribution. Now, one way to check might be where are they located right now, right? So they ended up looking later because they, you know, found that it was wrong and said, oh, he wasn't even there. Like this person was in Texas. They weren't actually at the site. Um, so different ways like that, the more and more that we think through how we would check, you know, are they on that site? Did they actually see that, you know? But you could also have people in the actual location, I guess, who would be saying something that's not true. If you don't have any surrounding information or context, it's really hard to verify that. You could potentially also compare it to other sources, like see if there is an orphanage. Let's say you use OpenStreetMap or some other source that has this kind of labeled data about what type of buildings are around. There are ways that you could try to see if something exists, like if it's not a complete and utter lie, but it really can be difficult at specific times to basically see if someone's telling the truth. If it's just one person particularly that you have a contribution from. Now, if you're doing physical observations and monitoring, I mean, it's it's more like a you know, specific thing that you might be able to see from remote sensing or look at another image or so on and so forth. With radiation, for example, though, you can't see that from remote sensing. You have to have a sensor in the area, on the ground or in the air, in that area. You can't, you know, cross check it with that. So I think it really depends on the specific hazard the specific type of information and the type of impact that someone's describing to be able to see what you could compare it to. And I think we do need to think a lot more about this idea of integration, because that's really, I think, the main way that we can check things is to compare them and with other sources that we have available and see if that actually holds up. No, that's a that's, that's a great answer. Uh, very informative. How uh, so? So from today's standpoint, there's a lot of there's a lot of crowdsourcing companies out there that have risen and fallen over the years. Uh, from your perspective, what are the current uh, projects or companies and, and, and organizations working on crowdsourcing efforts today? So there's a ton of different crowdsourcing efforts, um, some of which are very large and they have many projects that they host within them. And they've kind of, I guess, become repositories for projects. So like Zooniverse, for a lot of like, you know, online sort of projects. There's um, SciStarter um, for like a whole cluster of different citizen science projects. Um, and there's just a number of different, uh, let's say biodiversity or biological or conservation projects like iNaturalist or eBird. Um, I think iNaturalist has like maybe 40 million or so contributions now. Um, and, 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 and just to kind of highlight the difference, uh, how much of what you're describing now are actually uh, for-profit organizations or open source or, or open contra contribution type of uh, initiatives? So to my knowledge, the ones I mentioned are not actually for-profit. I think, so eBird is based out of Cornell. Um, it's really a birding sort of project. I think it kind of is similar to like the Christmas bird watch sort of thing that was really popular for many years and is still ongoing. Um, I'm actually not too tied with the monetary um, side of things. So I guess I don't have a specific answer of different projects that are um, doing it for money. I guess, I mean, Mechanical Turk, of course, does it for um, many different projects. And there's often a financial reward or a financial side of that component of that. And I think there's also this ongoing discussion about whether you should have free labor 
from crowdsourcing. And this kind of gets into some of these ethical kind of considerations too, as is it just a free contribution out of the goodness of your heart and for the love of science, for, for the love of, you know, spreading information that's important for other people or informing people, or should there be some sort of contribution for people that are, or some sort of, I don't know, like financial compensation, let's say, for being involved in specific projects. Well, that makes sense because uh, from a voluntary standpoint, you actually might get in some ethical conversations of who actually owns the intellectual rights to your contribution in the first place. If it's voluntary, I feel like you might have just as much of a say of owning your contribution as the as the organization itself. Uh, for it's, if, if it, and that might actually spur if it's monetary, you're actually paying for a service for people to contribute to you where then it's more of an exchange at that point. So, um, and, but, so I think there's a lot of things that that alleviates, even though that it does take a kind of another, put put some more ethical topics into that mix as well. Uh, So what what are your opinions on that? Yeah. So I think it really goes back to some of what people consider some ethical principles about the use or the contributions from citizen science. And a lot of people say, well, if you have a contribution that's going back to that group, that you have open data, that you allow people to be able to access it, analyze it, use it for their own purposes. Let's say for eBird, like I could have a whole collection of my birds, you know, that I've seen. And there's some sort of interface by which I can interact and use my data. And it's not just that I got paid. It's a one-off survey, a mechanical Turk and you know, you move on from there, I got my 10 bucks or whatever it is. Um, So it's a different type of engagement. And I think this is really goes back to like what we think of these different like citizen science kind of breakdowns. Um, And I guess overall, a lot of times when people think citizen science, they think of like this contributory and only contributory. There's some organization that's asking for something and you contribute to it. But more and more, they're having these projects that are more like co-created where you have a group that's working with another organization, a research institution, or something like that, with people who have similar values about social good, and they're trying to integrate it in a way in which it helps researchers to be able to answer different scientific questions, and it also helps the community to answer scientific questions that they have. And we also are seeing these kind of like collaborative projects where there's like an equal um, use or an equal weighted, I guess, benefit. And... And a lot of the ones I cover are kind of these collegial, which are people starting up the projects themselves, and they might not actually be affiliated with any institution. Um, And then in addition, there's this category that's a lot of um, local or community groups are actually contracting um, to get specific work done for specific questions that they have about the environment a lot of times in their areas, let's say air quality, and you contract with a group in order to get that done for your area. And you might also contribute to it, um, your data. And so a lot of times there's more of these purposes now that I think where people are trying to democratize science and really thinking about are there ways in which we can have a relationship between what was traditionally, you know, these scientists that are looking at, you know, the others versus the people actually contributing and asking questions that they want to know about in their area. And I think it's a really powerful movement and it's starting to become like a part of a lot of governance in the European Union because they created um, uh, some legal frameworks by which they have to communicate and work with communities um, in order to have different environmental changes that affect people um, in, many, in many parts of the world now. And I think it's becoming more of a conversation by which you can collect data about something, have it analyzed, have it understood, interpret it, and really create the kind of this community around the data and the analysis and that really this information that develops. Um, And then can also determine what types of policies are played out in those areas based on both the people's interest and the scientific knowledge they've developed together. Do you feel like there is a uh, uh, the crowdsourcing community or people doing these types of projects? Do you do you feel like there are central 
uh, websites, hubs, or standard areas that people can grab these, you know, best practice policies or standardize the data output, that type of thing? Are there places people can go to kind of figure out what the best practices are for these, uh, these types of initiatives? Yeah, so there's a co-data group. I'm actually part of their citizen science task force. And there is a set of ethical standards and really this push for open data um, and being able to have it part of the full scientific community and the local um, communities to be able to utilize it. And I can send you a link afterwards um, that we could maybe post with this video so that people could have access to that. And also some ethical principles that kind of go along with that, which as people continue to think about developing these projects or having these partnerships um, to really like keep in mind um, to make sure that there's ethics involved in the creation of the project and consider some of these other areas um, that they might not have thought of just off the cuff because there is a lot of research here and a lot of people who've been in this space for a while. Awesome. We'll definitely post that in the show notes uh, for people to review afterwards. Uh, so with that said, uh, can you talk to me about Maybe some of the current work that you're doing, you hinted at it before uh, with with your current uh, dissertation, right, or, or your current project? Yeah, so I've talked about some of the Fukushima work, which was like the first portion of my dissertation, but I also did a project related to flooding. And so I looked at citizen science contributions of flood levels, and it was derived from images that people had taken of flooding in specific areas and then marked based on what was surrounding it to try to get an idea of how high the flood level was. And then combine these with USGS water gauges and also using modeling, model data, hydrodynamic models. And so what I saw was really that people's contributions are a lot of times in areas where people are, which makes a lot of sense. And so they're often in city areas and they really show like the extent of the flooding within urban areas and within spaces where people live in towns. Um, whereas a lot of these USGS sort of monitoring um, are excellent quality and you know gauges where you have these long time series of the water levels, but they're often along the rivers themselves. And it can be difficult to predict exactly how far the flood extent is from that river based on those observations that you have and remote sensing during these times can be very limited. A lot of times when you have a hurricane, you've got a lot of cloud coverage. And so it can be really difficult to actually see the ground to be able to see if there's flooding in a specific area. And so I looked at this as a way to try to fill that gap and be able to say, okay, so we have a river gauge here and it says there's four feet of flooding from USGS. And if you go a little bit further in, it says there's two feet here. And this is where people's houses are. This is where we have the property data. And so you can basically estimate um, how many people are flooded in different areas and try to get like a better idea of how far the, the river actually flooded. And it's specific. Is area. this data that you can validate with maybe SAR imagery to kind of assess the compare with, uh, you know, how, uh, like I said, that discrepancy between the gauges that you're seeing with the rivers as, as with the citizens who are reporting how the flooding is in their area? Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually what I used as the fourth data set with here for comparison um, was using SAR imagery. It was from the ARIA project, it's JPL, I believe. Um, and they basically have by pixel um, the areas that are flooded. Um, and there are, of course, some spatial limitations sometimes and also temporal. So you have a specific image at a specific time, but you don't have it the hour before and the hour before that. And I think there's a lot more need for having more of these SAR um, imagers available. So we have more of this temporal, this timeline. And I guess this kind of goes to my understanding of looking at different events and disasters as a system. And so if you look at it as a system in which you need information at specific time periods, you might have contributions for specific um, sensors, specific satellites, specific things at specific times, but they might not be available at all of them. And so if I wanted to know if something's flooded, well, if I don't get an image for three or four hours after the peak of an event, I might not actually capture the peak of when the actually the most flooding was and when those houses were actually impacted. And so I think this is where you can combine them. So yes, yeah, SAR can be very useful during events if you have it at the specific time and place that you need it. 
Um, but it's trying to like combine these and saying, okay, so we didn't have it available until three or four hours afterwards at specific places during Hurricane Florence that I was looking at. But, you know, because we have these other sources, we can fill it in and use the stream gauges, use the modeling and use these citizen science contributions to see what the full extent was. Because it was only at that time. And this is particularly important for a lot of flash flooding. And so I've been working with a group at, with IRI, which is at its climate and society um, with Andrew Krushowitz. And we've been really looking at this idea of these contributions to help inform during flash flooding because it's such a brief period that you might not actually have contributions from other sensors. And you might have people say, oh, it was flooded, but you know the evidence of it is that you have to go out there physically and look. And there might be other ways where we could also do this from a humanitarian point of view with rescuing people in specific areas. And then also from a insurance sort of view where you can confirm that there actually was flooding in that area because of all the contributions of people saying that there's flooding. And the way I look at this is a lot of times the weight of the data of, I looked at a vent with, uh, with Hurricane Sandy and looked at power outages. And I had some questions where people say, well, how do you know people actually had their power outages in those areas? And I'm like, well, if you have 100,000 people in Manhattan saying their power out is probably out, and then you can compare it then to nightlight imagery is what I did at the same time um, where we had the you know, social media data at the same time as the remote sensing image that we collected to compare and see if those areas were actually characteristic of where we had power outages and then use that for when we don't have data from the other source. So some of this crowdsourcing you take from just uh, indirectly from maybe social media or something like that, but from, from something like this, your project here, how do you, how do you, from a research project standpoint, how do you get people involved with enough sample data, especially for something that's ad hoc as a, maybe a flash flood or a disaster? How do you, how do you reach out and say, Hey, are you willing to report this even though that, you're going through this or do you reach out to people who are maybe less directly impacted but are willing to kind of watch out for this kind of thing and go out on their own and uh and report it but what's what's the procedure there yeah i think a lot that's really important here is that you have some sort of pre-existing project where people already plugged into it i think that's when you can get the most contributions for a specific event of course, there's going to be people who want to join during that event. So if you have ways in which you're publicizing it, I've seen things in like newspapers or things like that that get put out, released as articles where you can click and, you know, add your own flood data um, for an article about flooding, let's say. Um, and so there's ways to kind of engage, I think, and bring people in by corresponding with the media. But then also these communities that are already so engaged with that. So if you do get your project onto a group like iNaturalist or something that already has a huge following, it's really a lot easier to kind of develop that base that you have of contributions. Or then also if you have a local community that you can plug into. So if you already have a community group that you're engaged with, it could be in your own area even, um, is a good place to start really, um, to think about what are concerns in your area and if there are ways in which you can help people to answer specific questions or engage with science. So before you mention something that is very important is integration. And, uh, and, and, and so a lot of this is research and, and, and proving that this is useful practices but implementation uh, down the road, how do you see something like what you're doing or even what crowdsourcing projects are doing? How do you see something like this? Let's talk about this project specifically, uh, the operationalization of this towards something that maybe can scale on a more bigger public level. I don't see the general public maybe like participating in some of those individual crowdsourcing sites, but how do you get them more involved? Like, okay, I got this, this works, it's a solid plan. Huh? And uh, where do you see the best fit to getting people more involved directly on a larger scale into uh, contributing to these types of data points? Yeah, so I think a lot of people um, really focus on... And by the way, this is kind of like, so if you can what's what's the dream of where you see this, you know, turning out for, for the work that you do, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, some of the groups I've seen that have done it really well have engaged across many different levels. For example, there's like a quake alert in California. And they basically engaged with education and so like really getting students involved with it and then also with local policymakers 
and got it advertised. It was on television a lot. And it was really kind of this time when they had a lot of people that downloaded the app and are able to contribute when there's an earthquake. And the idea here is that you give some lead time, sometimes like a minute or so, but you know, for people a little further over, it could help them to find cover or get out of a risky place. Or I don't know, like there could be a lot of things that you can do in a minute. I know it's not a lot of time, but you know, maybe you're in a space that is risky and you can actually do something about it. And so the idea of pushing alerts so that you have this kind of information from other people. And I think that's really this as idea of community, of sharing information. And if you can find a way that people say, huh, I can contribute and I can also get a benefit out of it, I think that's where you get the most engagement and where people are going to start um, getting interested. So it could be a number of things with publicity, with using it for different events. I think they had some things with using it for shutting down trains first. So if... If there was an alert, it would make the train stop in the area so that, you know, to save any potential issues there. And so it was kind of like some news stories and it gained some interest. And I think there can be ways to kind of gradually build up the trust and the interest in those topics. So do you think that uh, crowdsourcing in general, like regardless of the use of it itself, it could also promote the use and uh, need for maybe more sensors in an area? You mentioned flooding, right? You know, and, and you can't, you know, a lot of the uh, houses or, or beyond the riverbank or beyond the flood zone perhaps doesn't get monitored as much, but proving it through crowdsourcing uh, might say, hey, from an insurance standpoint, from a home builder standpoint, now on default, maybe we need to install sensors so that we don't need to rely on the people as much to report this. We'll just have it on default upon installing these uh, maybe new developments and new homes. Uh, you feel like it can mm -hmm. inspire new types of technologies and new sensors as well? I think so. Yeah, I think this is kind of this push of the Internet of Things. And I think this is like part of this general push, right, of having many different sensors contributing. Um, so it could be things with flooding. I mean, it could be putting different types of gauges on the sewers, you know, on specific things that are affecting urban areas so that you do have that feed in of data. Um, you could also, um, I could imagine different things with air quality. There's been a real push of trying to improve um, air quality sensing over a city as opposed to just a few places like DC, I think has like two places that are like the main ones that collect every hour for air quality. Well, what if you could have like a hundred, you know, or a thousand, 2000, right? And you can kind of get more and more at this fine grained level. And I think it also scientifically allows us to ask finer grain questions. So instead of just looking at trends over time, we can look at trends over time in relationship to specific events, in relationship to traffic, you know, in relationship to a number of different... Oh, that one seems like a no-brainer, too. I mean, those, those should be installed. Uh, air quality sensors, I think, should be installed, like, maybe at every cell tower. I mean, those there's enough of them in the area. And uh, there's so much space yeah. on those things. Why not? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think there could definitely be more push here. And also this idea of open data, because I'm sure there are many more air quality sensors in these different cities and in these areas, but they're not part of this network a lot of times. They're not integrated. So you might have some, you know, university collecting data on this and NOAA or another group's collecting data on that, but it might not all be integrated and shared. And so I think that's a lot of the push here as we as scientists and we as citizens can get a lot more information about a space by contributing the data. And you also might consider it at different levels. So maybe you have some um, sensors also on cars because that's actually what people are breathing in. So it's a real direct you know, influence there. Whereas a cell tower might be far enough up that you get a different pattern of the pollution and the movements that can also be important. But it's like thinking about, I guess, these different components. And I think the idea of people monitoring themselves can really like create that because you're thinking more at the individual level of how are people actually impacted by this event. Um, so I think there's a lot there that can be done and we can think about many different types of environmental hazards that can be related and that we can use data and even data that might seemingly not be related exactly can sometimes have a really important impact or, you know, you might not always instantly think of precipitation data as feeding into hydrodynamic models, but it's really important. And so people collecting that at a very localized level can help to have an understanding of storm, you know, imp storms impact in those 
cities or if they have runoff. So. Sorry, I muted myself there. Uh, awesome. Uh, well, I want to give you a chance. Is there any last minute plugs, things you would like to let the audience know about some of the projects that you're working on, projects that are out there uh, before we wrap up for, uh, for this segment? Yeah, I think one first or one thing that I wanted to make sure to mention is I think there are a number of ethical considerations that we really need to think about in relation to environmental hazards and exposure of people in these areas. Because you really want to make sure that these types of projects are not actually exposing people to more harm in a specific area and without their understanding of what that harm is. Um, and so I think there's really a need to think about what sort of review that we have of these different projects. And because like an in institutional review, we have, you know, a specific breakdown of harms and risk and making sure that, you know, individuals um, aren't receiving more harm by participating in this project. So we don't want someone going into the middle of a river to get a picture. Like we want to make sure that there is guidelines, that there's this, you know, specification here for each individual so that people aren't actually becoming more at risk. And so I think there needs to be more of an evaluation of that and more of a uh, thought behind that and hopefully some engagement between practitioners within these crowdsourcing and citizen science spaces with people who are designing these projects to make sure that there's like an outside view of, yeah, it'd be really great to get that picture, but you know, you have to think about some of these implications. And I think my second point would be the need for more methods of evaluating data from these sources and thinking about how we can integrate them, how we can fuse the sources, how we can check them, look at anomalies, um, many, many different things. And also lead these into machine learning projects for validation, for labeled data. Um, I think there's a lot of contributions that crowdsource data can have. Um, we just need to think about how to integrate them in a way that's really meaningful. Um, to look at that fitness for use and look at whatever decision making is being done from both the individual to national and international level. Absolutely. And as, as machine learning is becoming more uh, a, a lot more of a bigger topic in uh, uh, recent years and, and, and probably going to be a lot bigger going forward, too. Uh, I would love to get into that discussion some other time. We just don't have time for that for this segment. Uh, but it sounds like there's a lot to talk about there, especially uh, the connection between crowdsourcing and machine learning. Uh, so with that said, I want to appreciate you for joining the, uh, the discussion here on Project Geospatial. Uh, having your insight and your opinions on the topic have been very informative for the, uh, for the audience. And uh, I can't wait to see the type of feedback we're going to get from this. So I appreciate you come on the show to talk about your expertise. Uh, um, you're, you, you've been an amazing guest, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for Absolutely. inviting me. Uh, I'm Adam Simmons here with uh, Dr. Caroline, uh, Caroline Holquist. Uh, and then once again, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Mm -hmm.